Hi. Um, thank you for having me here. Thank you, SITM. And thank you for keeping me as the third speaker, because if I were to hear four, four more speakers, I would have panicked and run. I have this childish impulse right now to, you know, after listening to the first two speakers, to say, many kill and go out. You know, Dr. Benny Prasad was brilliant, was so convinced that he's the best that he just left. No, no, he was really, really good. Uh, so I'm, I'm probably the back she uh, black sheep of all the, you know, speakers here. So I'll probably keep it a little short. Yeah. So we'll just go into it. Yeah. What do you want to do in life? You know, we have all been asked this question. I was asked this question when I was uh, in sixth or seventh, and I told my parents that I wanted to be a mechanical engineer. And there was a reason why I said that. You know, the reason lies in the Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Can you go to the next one? Yeah, so uh, Maslow told us that, you know, there's a certain hierarchy by which, you know, we decide uh, on the things that we want in life. The first is physiological needs, which basically tell you that, you know, you have enough to eat, you have water to drink, you have, you know, air to breathe in, that you're alive. The second is the safety needs, which basically says that you have a job. You know, you have enough to provide for yourself. The third is love and belonging, which basically says you have a wife or a girlfriend or a family and stuff like that. After that comes esteem, and after that is self-actualization, which, which is a more spiritual concept. We'll, we'll stick at safety, right? Because uh, this talk is about the safe choices I've made and how it has hurt me. So why I took mechanical engineering as a career? Uh, because it was a safe option. Uh, I belong to a family of mechanical engineers. My dad an, is an ITN, my grandfather is a mechanical engineer, all my mamas and my chachas are mechanical engineers, and none of them have starved to death. So I thought, you know, it's a, it's a very uh, safe option to take, you know. Mechanical engineering is known to be an evergreen stream. So I thought, you know, uh, I'll do it. And they were all my role models. So I thought, you know, it's, it's something that, that I should do. But while I was giving my entrance examination and while I was studying, there was also this other thing that used to happen, that I was deeply into books. Right? I'm a Bengali and, you know, Bengali kids are not fed until they read a Salman Rushdie or a Rabindranath Tagore. We are that, we are that into books. So I started to write. Before Facebook came in, we had Orkut. Orkut, I don't know how many of you had profiles on Orkut, but before Facebook, there was Orkut. And Orkut used to be, you know, less talkerish. They used, uh, computers weren't that uh, penetrative, no pun intended. Uh, and Orkut used to be, you know, uh, the first social networking site. So when you used to fr uh, send a friend request to pe to people, they generally used to accept it, accept it, right? And uh, they used to follow you and they used to talk to you. Just, so just to impress girls, I started to maintain a blog. And you know, we had this small blogger community, and we used to blog and you know start to appreciate each other. And these bloggers started telling me that, that you know why don't you try to write a book? And I told them. And we all knew this fact that writers are very, very poor. And this was in 2004 or 2005. And none of us was wrong. This is, an, this is an article from last month which says that 77 percent of all authors earn less than 50,000 a year. And only 2 percent of all published authors can make a living out of writing. So I told them, there's no way, you know, this book that I'm writing, I'm going to finish it. But then something happened that actually led me to finishing this book. I took the CAT exam. No, so what happened was that there was this best friend of mine and we both, you know, took uh, times, uh, you know, those mock entrance examination and we used to be neck to neck. So when the CAT examination happened, he came out and he told me that, you know, I've done 45 questions and I was like, I've done only 30. So I knew that his percentile, but he was a big fake, so I knew his percentile will be higher, but not maybe by a huge margin. So I thought I need to have something on my CV that gives me that edge. And, you know, everybody lies on their CV and everybody says that I've, I love reading newspapers and I love listening to music and I do this and I do that. So I thought I'll have something genuine on my CV. So I went out with my book and I went to a few publishers and eventually one of those publishers said that, okay, I'll publish your book. And uh, I thought, you know, it's, it's a good selling point that I could go to that interview panel and tell that I'm a published author and I think I should be a student of your college. Incidentally, that did not happen and I had to give that entrance examination again next year. Uh, but the book got published. And I, I promptly forgot that, you know, something like that had happened because I had to study for my management examinations again. And I took that exam. And just when I was about to enter this management college and, you know, I had taken another 
a leap in my professional career i was about to enter management uh, mdi gurgaon which is a, which is a fairly good college my publisher called me and he told me this now 75000 copies in 2008 was a huge number uh by my estimation i think it was the second or the third most highest selling book in that year and you know the book used to feature in all those bestseller list and i used to call up my publisher thinking that it's it's a it's probably a publicity gimmick that you pay these bestseller lists uh, the people who you know compile these lists and they put it up there but he said no no everything is genuine so when he told me this and he told me that he wants another book out of me and i said you know i am entering mdi gurgaon it's it's cutthroat competition all these kids from you know delhi college of engineering nits and iits come there there's no way i'm going to have time to write another book my publisher told me just write anything for 240 pages and get it published i said i you know i and i was a marketing student so i thought i can manage that so that's when i did this so if you see the titles are more or less the same you know the first one was of course i love you till i find someone better it was cynical it was it was an attempt to being funny the rest three was exactly the same what i also did was i carried the same characters of the first book into the next three books so that you know if, if i sold 75000 copies of the first book i was like you know let's let's do an ap maybe the second book will sell 50000 maybe the next book will sell 25000 so i thought you know this is a safe option i can still you know i can still concentrate on my safe option which was management and i could still write books so that is why i wrote these three books and these three books were well received but they were not great but i did not think about it because i was too busy you know uh, battling with uh, with other students for cgpa and management you know the stakes are much higher in management education as you guys know one mistake can cost you know cost you the highest paying job on the campus and i did not want to you know tinker with that so now the placement season came and the placement season as you guys must know that it happens over a period of 4 or 5 days so day negative all the biggies come in you know two or three companies who want the you know best of the students so the first company that came to campus was png and png is very strict about their placement procedure they just take three interviews and that's it and they do not ask you anything about studies and all they just ask you the kind of person you are and you know stuff like that so three interviews happen for all the other students my interviews went into the 5th round the 6th round the 7th round and 8th round and i was like you know what's happening i i i called the hr uh, woman out there and i told her you know what's 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 going on and she told me listen i've been reading your books for the last 3 years and i know you do not want this job some day you you're going to find your calling in life i am going to be the person who sign your recruitment from and you'll you leave the company i cannot take you and i started convincing that woman you know this writing thing is is just something i do for money it it is not interesting at all it's not something that i plan to do ever in my life and for the next 15 minutes i tried to convince her no no i don't i did not sell 75000 copies everybody lies on the cv and then i started convincing her, her that i was actually a failed author and i planned to stop writing but that woman was no 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 enough 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 i'll not take you i was very angry luckily the next day american express came in and they wanted to interview me and just before the interview i took a fresh print out of my cv and i lied again i told them i have written just one book i wrote that book 3 years ago and after that i've done nothing regarding writing you know they asked me okay you don't want to write anymore i said are you are you crazy i i would rather work in your company and be a, be an asset and be hard working and be everything you know that you want me to be and i'll not write again and they're very happy you know he he he's not a jhola wala ladka so let's let's take him and i went into american express and you know we are the we are the young blood of american express american express is a very lazy company you know the average age there is around 30 35 and we are 24 year olds and we had all management roles so we all were there to prove ourselves so i started working 12 hour days 6 months passed by and i was writing a book and i Uh, and i write a book in you know 3 or 4 months all the people are less that i write a book in 15 days judging by the quality of it but 6 uh, months had passed and i had not finished writing a book and i was struggling and that's when i it hit me that for the first time this was the longest period that i had not even bought a single book and that's when i realized you know this is this is not something that i want to do for the rest of my life 
and that's when I took a knee-jerk reaction without even thinking. People make business plans and all of that, and you know, I had fibbed my way through management schools. You know, I I used to be a good writer, and I I I still presume that you know when when you are marketing students, your answer sheets are weighed. You know, the number of supplementary sheets you have, the more marks you score. So I used to go by that philosophy. So I made no business plan. I jumped into this this uh, business called publishing. This was the first unsafe option. Not only was I relying on something that had just convinced my employers that I had nothing to do with it. I'm a very bad writer. I was about to rely on that. Not only that, I was about to publish my own books. So I did not even have a publisher to blame my, you know, failures on. Now publishing is a is is a is it's not e-commerce, right? Nobody will come and buy your business even if you are failing. Nobody is going to put, you know, money in your business. Uh, even if you're showing losses, and it's a very hit and miss business, right? You can you can publish 20 books that you think are brilliant, but they can they can or they cannot work, right? It's very logistics heavy. You ha you have to employ you know 20 30 people just to manage the distribution, and it was a business I knew nothing about. The only thing that you know kept me going for the first six or seven months is that I was constantly around books. I was reading books. I was reading manuscripts. I was talking to new authors, and that's what kept me going. And after a year, we had 10 bestsellers on the top 100 list, which, which was a huge validation for me because, you know, when, as an author, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a very commercial author, as you know by the titles of my books. I'm, I'm very, very commercial. So pe when, when we got into publishing, publishing is supposed to be a sort of a noble job, you know. Uh, authors kind of uh, behave like they have the world. Uh, the weight of the world on their shoulders and they are they're making a big difference although I do not think that books make a big difference to people's life they just make them happy for a little bit it's the slowest form of change that can happen in any society but still people used to deride me and you know the others working with me that you're such young people I think you should get 10 years of experience in publishing and then get, that, then get into this business so this was a huge validation for us and when this happened I started getting that courage of doing something different and that's when I came out with my next book so I still wasn't that courageous, so I, did, I still had that, you know, subtitle. I still had those main two characters, you know, in the story. But my story was, for the first time, wasn't a college romance. And this book worked. And this book worked better than the first three books that I wrote when I was in management college and was studying, uh, you know, for getting a big job. Yeah. And after my fourth or the fifth book, people started telling me, Durjo, your books work because of four reasons. You have Deb and Avantika. Deb is an awkward boy uh, who is a reflection of every boy you know, who wants to get a girlfriend. Avantika is this really hot chick that every girl wants to be. There's a lot of sex in your books. It's always set in college. And you have this quirky title and the subtitle thing that works for you. And you say, fine. Next book, I'll make sure I use nothing of that. So the next book, I just wrote out of this feeling of revenge and I'll not use any of these things. So Till the Last Bread does not have a subtitle, Till the Last Bread does not have my main characters. It is not set in a college. I gave them a very, very grim setting, which is a hospital. So I took, I took those people on and I wrote Till the Last Breath and I think it's, uh, and till now I think it has, it has beaten all the records of my previous books. And after that I started writing from a woman's perspective. Then a tourism board came in and they wanted me to write a book that is set in Hong Kong and we are selling French rights of the book right now. And once that happened, you know, television opportunities came in because they knew that, you know, I have this, uh, I have this knack of churning out books in a really short period of time and I can write from different perspectives. So that's when Sada Huck came in. Uh, Sada Huck is a, is, till date, it is uh, the best running youth show that has ever debuted on Indian television and I think parts of it have been shot in SITM and you know this whole campus um, and then and that's when you know that and when Sada started working people started coming up to me and said why don't you write a daily soap and I had never watched a daily soap and, and you know please don't laugh at it daily soap is a, is a hell lot of hard work you know people have 10 hour meetings deciding what your character will wear I mean if you see that okay she, she's wearing a red sari there are actually 10 educated media people talking about what sari she'll wear. It's, it's a serious business. And it's a lot of money. 
you can't you and you know it changes i mean if you if you see the kind of reports these television people generate they they get this trp reports every thursday and they have minute by minute analysis and they go like oh she wore a blue sari and the and the television ratings went up make her wear a blue sari again she looks good in it that is the kind of detailing that goes into television and all and all the you know you look at it and say ha kya chal raha hai fir se wahi doodh gir gaya it's a we call it as a high point and you know there are actually claps going around this room that you know uh, there's a track which we were doing this is newly married woman who comes into a room and uh, you know everybody is expecting there's a chuda utarne wala ceremony and this woman does not have that chuda and the and the and the person who actually suggested that he she'll come into the chuda aur sab dekhenge aur uske haath mein chuda nahi hoga and everybody clapped at him you know this is such a brilliant path breaking idea this is nice soch i would have never done anything i would not have had these experiences had i had i stuck to my management job had i stuck to my engineering job it's only because i'm a very scared person but there was something behind that i was also doing side by side and there's one point in time when i actually took that unsafe option so you know a lot of you still have that opportunity to sort of nurture something that you want to do i mean you do not have to be good at it you know i'm not i'm not the best writer in the world i'm i'm probably in the you know one of the worst writers in india right now whose whose books work but at least i i have realized that this is something that gives me most pleasure i might not you know i might not get critical acclaim and with daily soaps you can't but at least i'm happy doing it i i i i i sit in that room and i clap at the guy who says this uska chuda nahi uska chuda nahi hoga i feel really happy you know so uh, so that i think i think i ran out of words being a writer that's embarrassing but thank you